Church's Bible study on demand. We are so glad that you are listening and tuning in wherever you may be. And I want to take a moment to thank all of you who have emailed us, who have written to us over social media saying how much the Bible study series have been a blessing to you. And we encourage you to please continue to share your thoughts, your ideas of how we can make this Bible study better, more informative for you so that you can learn more about the word of God. That's really the sole purpose of why we do this. Right now, we're in the book of 1 Peter, and today we'll be covering 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to read those verses so you can be familiar with what we're going to be covering today, and then we can certainly get started. Now, as a quick overview, I just want to give a summation of the book of 1 Peter. Small book, but still very powerful in nature in terms of what the Lord gave to Peter to share. And, and understand that Peter is writing uh, to believers. He's not writing to unbelievers. It's really not a book as we tend to think books of the Bible are when we think of Matthew or Isaiah or Exodus, longer books. Really, this is a letter. And this is a letter written by Peter to those who have been dispersed over different parts of what we now know as Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. And the three reasons why Peter wrote this particular letter is number one, how to have the hope of the believer, how to maintain hope in spite of suffering. And as I've said in this series before, I wish I could tell you that you as a believer would not experience heartache, pain, difficulties, hardships, but the Bible simply does not share that. You as a believer will experience difficulties, trials, tribulations, and more. And what Peter is saying is, no, not that you will not experience it. What Peter is saying is, since you are a believer, how do we still maintain our hope and belief and trust in God, even in those times? The second reason is the necessary perseverance and commitment of the believer. In order to endure suffering, and hardship and difficulties, you must learn how to persevere, how to take a stand, how to hang in there, how to just keep moving forward, even when you can't see light at the end of the tunnel. And what uh, enables you to do that is when you have a commitment, mm -hmm. a strong commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to make sure that you are aware of that. So as a review, the first point is the hope of the believer in the midst of suffering. The second one is the necessary perseverance of the believer through commitment to God. You got to learn how to hang in there, even through difficult times. And the last purpose of first Peter is the lifestyle of the believer. And in terms of the unbeliever being able to see the believer. In other words, how shall we live as Christians in this earth? So that even those who do not go to church, even those who do not know the Lord, don't know anything about God, can look at us and be able to say, while I don't know everything about you, what I do know is that maybe there's something different about you. How you carry yourself, how you speak, how you interact with people, how you do what you do. And so the lifestyle of the believer is critically important and a very important evangelistic tool to even unbelievers. So those are the three things of which Peter is addressing in this letter that he writes to believers who are scattered all over Asia Minor, which we also know as modern day Turkey. And all of this was under the realm of Christians being persecuted by the world. Having said that now, let's go ahead and jump in and I'm going to read uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. And it says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For this reason, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers 
may not be hindered. And that was 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7 from the New King James Version. Now, as a pastor, I had the privilege and the fortune of sitting down with couples who want to get married. And I talk with them before they get married and we go through a process. And without fail, one of the places where I take couples to two in the Bible is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. In these verses, Peter gives an illustration of things that matter not only to husbands and wives, but what matters also to believers. And there's a concept that for your husband to have gotten to the point of meeting you and dating you and being engaged to you and then marrying you suggests that you have some measure of influence in his life. What the verse is saying is that submission is a very important concept in the role of marriage. However, I will say here that submission is not just linked to the wife. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, 21 and 22, and in that area, it talks, Paul talks about that there should be a mutual submission one for another, that believers are to submit one to another. But then there is another level of submission in the terms of marriage, wives submitting to their husbands. But if you notice in this verse 1, wives, it says that even if some do not obey the word, in other words, even if there's a husband that you have married or somebody that you're dating that is not in the will of God, that has not lined themselves up with God, but yet you are, you're where you need to be, but he's not where he needs to be. And the Bible says very clearly in verse number one that he without a word, and that's, that's the key, without a word may be won by the conduct of the wife. So in other words, wives, if you really want your husbands to change or to make a difference or you want to see them do different things, if he's a man of God and if he's serious about walking with God, then the change and the differences in his life will not come by what simply you say. Men are visual creatures. As the verse says, the change will come when they see your conduct. So it is not then simply what you're asking him to do that's going to make the difference, but that in many cases you learn how to model what it is that you're looking for. And as he sees that, if he's sincere about the relationship, sincere about being a man of God, he will then begin to understand your position. So case in point, it's Sunday morning now and it's early in the morning. You, were, you, you are up now. You're ready to go to church. You may have kids and the kids are up. You're trying to get them ready for church. You ask your husband, hey, babe, do you want to go to church? He says, well, no, nah, not today um, because the football game's on at one o'clock. I want to make sure I'm good. Uh, you then, according to verse number one, should not stay home. What you should do, according to verse number one, they may be won over by the conduct of the wife. He needs to see that you're still willing to get up, take the kids, and go to church. Now, what that indicates is that as he sees you doing those things, and this is what verse 2 says, that when he sees your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, he needs to see, wives, that there is a reverence for God in your life, that that reverence for God will even go beyond his understanding of what and who God is. Because you must understand that for many husbands, they may not have had an environment where they grew up in where they know church, they know God, they know prayer, they know what all of that means. So many times you may be asking, hoping, praying for your husband to do or to be someone that really they've never seen before. And so now what God is saying is, is that you become, in many cases, the model for him. When he sees your conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, the wearing of gold or ranging of hair or putting on a fine apparel. And what Peter is saying is that not that those things aren't important, but there's some other things in your life, wives, that are more important than the exterior. Verse 4 says, Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Wives, your spirit is much more important than your exterior beauty. Your inner beauty will go much further than your external beauty. 
And as you grow older with your husband, you'll begin to understand that that sensitive spirit, that prayerful spirit, that that spirit that you have in aligning yourself with your husband so that you all can move forward in whatever goals and dreams that God has for you is, according to the scripture, very precious in the sight of God. So wise in the verse, what Peter is saying is that wives likewise, just as citizens in the previous chapter, citizens have to submit to government, so let wives submit to their own husbands. Now, submission should not be thought of as a negative or nasty term. What submission should be thought of is alignment. You are aligning yourself, wives, with your husband so that you're not fighting each other, which is friendly fire in the military, but that you together can work together to fight the enemy. So submission is important. But husbands, make no mistake. The verses don't simply stop at the role of the wife. When you look at verse number seven, there's so many things in verse number seven that are powerful to the husband to know and to understand. Verse number seven says, wives likewise dwell with them. Husbands likewise dwell with them, which is the wife, with understanding. Give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, physically. Understand that they're heirs together as the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So let's look at that again. Husbands, dwell with them with understanding. We cannot simply say we don't understand them. We don't get them. It is part of our responsibility to try to learn how to understand our wives better. We are to honor them as being the weaker vessel, not mentally, not spiritually, but the weaker vessel in physical form only. We are to also understand that they are heirs together with us, which means that the same inherited blessings that God promises to men, he also promises to women because God is no respecter of person. So that means that just because we are considered to be quote unquote head of household does not mean that the wife gets any less of an inheritance than the husband gets. We are heirs together in the grace of life. Now, all of those things are important, but husband, when you look at the last part of verse seven, this is what seals the deal. And when I first read this verse, I couldn't believe it. I had to reread it and reread it and reread it to make sure I understood what it was saying. It says, wives, husbands dwell with the wives according to understanding. Honor them as the weaker vessel. Understand that they're heirs together with us in the grace of life. Here it is, that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, do you understand what that means? That means that as you are praying to the Lord for certain things, literally, your prayers could be delayed or not answered simply on the basis of how you treat your wife. And so now I hope you understand that there is significance in husbands honoring their wives in the same way that God honors the church. And there's significance in wives submitting to God in the same way that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should submit to Christ. That is the analogy that is given in these verses. And so that is, in essence, what chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 is, is dealing with submission, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, and also how they both work together to give an illustration of how the church should submit to Christ and how Christ should be the husband over the church and care for it and nurture it and develop it so that the church can grow. We hope you've enjoyed today's Bible study on 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. More in this Bible study series to come. Until next time, be blessed and be a blessing to someone else. Take care.